morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? Are we doing great? Were you blessed by that worship set just now? Oh my goodness gracious. I don't even know why I need to preach. You know, let's just call it good and, uh, you know, we'll just make a day of it. I do have some things here I brought with me. I, I do want to know how many of you in the house are the people who make the shakes or the smoothies around the household? Let me see your hands. Come on, be passionate about it. You, you, you make the shakes or the smoothies. How many of you just like to drink shakes or smoothies? That's what I thought. I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand in the back. Yes. Well, uh, I'm going to make just kind of something here in just a minute. But before I do, I want to talk to you about what we're going to get into today, because I believe that one of the most natural ways that God has given us to reconnect with him and to reconnect with with God's purpose for our lives is through prayer. I believe God has given that to us as a gift of communicating with him and, and he communicating to our hearts as well. But, but also with that, I also believe that the absence of prayer could mean a disconnect with God. Would you agree with that? You think, is that a fair assessment? Okay, so we're gonna unpack that this morning, but before we do, I, I do wanna just kinda put a few ingredients here into the blender. I, I do have some lettuce leaves. Any lettuce leaf fans? And I just dropped my notes. Any lettuce leaf fans in the house for your, okay, yeah. All two of you, thank you very much. Rest of you put Snickers bars, I, I get it. I get it. Uh, how about strawberries? We have any strawberry fans? Oh yeah. Let's, let's put some strawberries in. I'll, I'll, I'm a fan of strawberries. Put a couple more in. Uh, blueberries. Any? I heard a boo just now. Some blueberries. Now, I know that throughout this message, you're going to be wondering if I'm going to hit the start button on this thing, aren't you? You're just going to, but I, you, you, you're you sitting there going, I hope that my, you know, the, the sticker is under my seat and I win the smoothie, you know, uh, but not this service. I'm sorry. We're not going to start this thing up. But I, I do know that it's interesting because it's hard sometimes to, to guarantee that we're going to get what we hope for when we put the ingredients in. In fact, if you are a superstar at guaranteeing that the flavor you get out is going to be the same thing every single time, I wanna meet you after this service. I wanna shake your hand. We're gonna have a special service just for you. But, but here's, what I'm, here's what I'm learning. I'm learning that even, uh, this is kind of a silly illustration, but even as, as we know for sure the ingredients that we're putting in, a lot of times we don't know what's gonna come out. And you know, I'm connecting that in my own personal life to prayer. Because a lot of times we're putting in what we believe is the, are the right ingredients, you know? We're, we're trying to word it just the right way. We're, we're really trying to express to God what's in our heart. We're doing our very best to put in the ingredients that we think are going to bring about the results we desire. And sometimes, you know what? What comes out is not what we thought we were gonna get. So we're gonna unpack this a little bit this morning. Um, I wanna give you two examples today of godly men in the scripture who both prayed specific prayers. And one of them got exactly what they asked for and the other one got something different, but it was what they needed. So we're gonna unpack this today because I believe this is where we are. Sometimes we pray for something, we put in the ingredients and we get exactly what we expect. Sometimes we, we put in the ingredients and, and we don't. So let's unpack this. First Chronicles chapter four, verses nine and 10. The prayer of Jabez. How many of you back in the early 2000s either bought the book called the prayer of Jabez or you have heard of the book called the prayer of Jabez? Let me see your hands. Okay, that's a lot of us, that's a lot of us. I will just tell you right now, it sold 4.4 million copies. And you're about to see why. Let's read the prayer together. Uh, the scripture says in 1 Chronicles 4, verse 9 and 10, there was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because of his birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. Now listen to this. Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. 
Please be with me in all that I do. And this last part kind of cracks me up. And do keep me from trouble and pain. You know? But, but watch the result. And God granted him his request. Are you serious? You know, I can get the bless me part. You know, okay, God bless me. And, and I can get, even get into this part about God expand my territory. In fact, I prayed that during COVID and I wasn't real specific about what part of the territory I wanted God to expand and he expanded my waistline about two inches. So if you're gonna pray the prayer of Jabez, make sure you are real specific with what you mean. But this last part, God, would you, would you keep me from all trouble and pain? Are you serious? And God granted his request. The prayer of Jabez, 4.4 million copies sold. Let's look at another guy in the scripture that prays another prayer. His name is the Apostle Paul. He went through everything you could imagine, including death, for his faith. He's responsible for at least 14 books of the New Testament. He was, by and large, the second greatest missionary on the face of the earth, next to Jesus Christ only. As a matter of fact, I want you to let this sink in for just a minute. Don't just, don't just go through the motions with me this morning. I want you to let this sink in. There's a good chance you're sitting in a church today because of this man's work. How about that? But his story is a little bit different than Jabez. You see, at some point in Paul's journey, and you can read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Lord had given him some special visions and some special revelations. I'm not going to go into all that right now. But the bottom line was that because of that, Paul said in order to keep him from boasting about this fact that he had this these revelations from God and these visions from God that a thorn was given to him in his flesh. You remember the story, at least part of that. That's where we get, you know, all oh, that person, they're a thorn in my flesh. Well, this is where it comes from. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Paul had a thorn in his flesh and we don't know exactly what that thorn was. Some theologians believe it was some type of an eyesore or some type of a vision problem. Uh, we don't really know exactly what it was, but here's what we do know. We do know that, watch this, three different times Paul sent his prayers up for the thorn to be removed. And three different times the Lord responded, as we see in the scripture here, verse 9, he, each time he said, My grace is all you need, for my power works best in weakness. So we have one godly man in the Old Testament who prayed, God, would you just kind of let life be a little bit easier for me and would you expand my influence? And God said, okay. And then we have another individual in the New Testament who went through beatings after beatings after imprisonment after imprisonment leading to his death. And God said, my grace is sufficient. Let me just be honest with you about prayer. Prayer can be difficult. Prayer can be challenging. One of the reasons prayer can be challenging is because it's boring. And if you're a high energy person, prayer can just drive you crazy. You know? Oh my gosh, I gotta take time to pray. And it can just wear you out. Prayer can be confusing. Because, again, we want to put the right ingredients in to get the right result out. Are you with me this morning? This is where we live right here. We, we, we want to try to word things the right way. And let me just stop and say this. God listens to you through a spiritual stethoscope. That's how he hears your prayer. So we want to put in the right words. We're not sure what to say. We're not even sure if he hears us. And then sometimes we can pray the same thing. Some of you are struggling right now with people that you love in your life. You're praying for them, you're praying for them, you've been praying for them, you're not seeing any change. You're not seeing anything going on different in your life. And you're sitting there going, well, what's the use? Why do I just, why do I keep praying? What's the point? 
We keep putting the ingredients in, but we don't seem to keep getting anything out. I want to, I want to quickly just kind of dispel some myths about prayer. Sometimes we can believe that prayer is just for those little old ladies in the back of the church in a room somewhere that, that's just kind of keeping everything afloat. Let me tell you something. I, when I was an associate pastor at a church in Valley Springs, we had a group of those little old ladies. And I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, it was on Thursdays around the noon hour. And they would come in and they would have all their prayer lists and all their prayer sheets and they would go to that back room and they would pray. And I remember early on my pastor encouraging me, Philip, you need to just go and hang out with these ladies. And you need to pray with them. And I'm sitting here going, <laughs> seriously? So I go back there and, and then, of course, I'm, you know, I'm kind of wearing the badge. I'm the associate pastor. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to pray with these ladies. Let me just tell you something. Those little old ladies took me to school in prayer. They knew how to get a hold of heaven. And they walked with Jesus. And there was something different about them. But prayer's not just limited to them. Sometimes we think prayer's limited to a specific time and place throughout the day. And I have no problem whatsoever with praying over a meal and praying when you're here at church and, and all of those type things. But God wants us to have conversational prayer. Remember, he listens to us through a sp spiritual stethoscope. Some of you are here today and you can't even find the words to pray. But he hears this. Sometimes we think that prayer is only for emergencies, and I have no problem with us praying for emergencies. I'm raising kids, and if you're raising kids, you understand what that's like. You're constantly praying emergency prayers. Jesus, please get them to Sonic and back, please. <laughs> Lord, please let them find their debit card, you know. <laughs> you know. God, would you please make sure they get their Chromebook charge for testing, you know. I have no problem with that. In fact, I believe that God answers that. But listen, I believe, here, here's my point. I believe God wants more for us. He wants more for us than just the emergency prayers. A couple things about prayer. Prayer matters to God. I know it sometimes it doesn't feel that way. But prayer does matter to God. In fact, depending on what version of the Bible you read, there are roughly 365 to 367 different verses specifically mentioning prayer in the Bible. I would say it matters to him. In fact, somebody out there has probably already written a devotional book with every one, one of those in it for one, every day of the year. I don't know. We have everything from Hannah's prayer in, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1 where she prays for a child. And then you walk through and we have the, the prayers of David. And if you want to see how to pray, read the Psalms. Amen. Goes all the way into the New Testament. We see Jesus modeling the Lord's prayer. And then we see Jesus a little bit later on praying in the garden to the extent that his sweat became like drops of blood. Prayer matters to the heart of God. Ephesians 6.18 reminds us, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert, be persistent in your prayers for all the believers everywhere. I love Hebrews 11, verse 6. It is impossible to please God without faith. By the way, prayer is your exercise of faith. Anyone who wants to come to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Prayer matters to God. Not only does prayer matter to God, but there are things, listen, there are things that God won't do unless we pray. There are a lot of if-then statements in the Bible. And in my research, I believe there was somewhere around 57 of them. 57 if-then. If you, and, and most of it was, had to do with God wanting to respond to his people in a favorable way. If you do this, God says, I'm going to do this. Now, that's been kind of taken out of context in some modern-day Christianity. 
with people on television saying, if you'll send me $1,000, God's going to do this in your life. And it's caused a lot of spiritual disillusionment. But there are things that God won't do unless we pray. God, prayer releases the hand of God. I love 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. And I'm going to forgive their sin. I'm going to restore their land. That's a pretty good if then. Wouldn't you agree? Prayer matters to God. There are things God won't do until we pray. Thirdly, how we treat each other affects how we pray. How we treat each other affects how we pray. Uh, one might say it this way, how we pray affects how we live. But also how we live affects how we pray. It's both and. I've, I, I grew up uh, much like Pastor Vince in the sense of, of my church upbringing. And there was always a strong emphasis, and I believe in this. There was a strong emphasis in the, in the believer's personal devotional life. That time spent in prayer, that time spent in God's word, I do believe that that is the anchor to the soul for the Christian. And I believe that wholeheartedly, and I believe that it was used, hey, I need to get my mind right, I need to get my spirit right, I need to get my life pointing in the right direction so that I can face the day. Are you with me this morning? Okay, but I wonder how many of us grew up believing and understanding that we need to face the day believing that how I live today is gonna to help me pray tomorrow. And let me tell you something, God cares so much about this. In fact, we're gonna unpack this in a scripture real quick. In Matthew chapter five, verse 23, the scripture says this. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, Pastor Vince talked about this last week. Thank the Lord we're not having to do this anymore. But we're going to draw the principle from it. He said, if, if you're having to do this and you suddenly remember at your place of worship, if you remember that someone has something against you, watch this, leave your sacrifice there at the altar and go and be reconciled with that person. Hmm. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. What's the principle that we're drawing from here? What he's saying is, is that we as the people of God have got to quit just shoving stuff under the rug and we got to deal with what is. And God says, I would rather you deal with your differences out there before you come in here. Because what happens? If I'm in, a tank, in, a, in an entanglement with somebody out there, then my worship in here is going to be cluttered. I am, if I'm dealing with something out there and I'm refusing to deal with it, I'm not making something right with somebody, I've wronged somebody, I've said the wrong thing, I've acted toward them in the wrong way, and I'm not dealing with it, the scripture says God would rather me deal with it than come into the house of worship. Hello. I'm not saying every situation is going to be reconcilable. I'm not ignorant, I know that. But in the day-to-day -day stuff, God wants us to deal with it. We have a, uh, in my driveway, we have a filter, kind of a drain, that's just to the right of my driveway. It's about a one foot by one foot, and sometimes it get clogged up with, with leaves and mud, all kind of stuff, and, and we have to go out there with the rake we got to push it out of the way because if we don't, when it rains, watch this, when it rains and that thing's covered, my driveway becomes a, a fishing pond. Just come catch some trout in my driveway. We'll just stock that sucker. That's what happens. What happens in our relationships when we don't deal with things? Oh, it gets cluttered. Stuff starts bagging up. We end up with a pond that we got to wade through. Right? But on the other hand, watch this. When we do deal with those things and we make sure that we are reconciled with each other and we stay connected to each other and we treat people the right way and at least we do everything on our part to make things right, guess what? 
There is freedom in my spirit to pray. There is freedom in my spirit when I walk in the sanctuary. There's freedom in my spirit to worship. I don't have anything cluttering me up. How we treat each other affects our ability to pray. And how we pray affects the way we live. I want to give one final point today, and you've listened so well. I, I appreciate your attentiveness today, and, and I do greatly value the time to be with you. What do I do when it seems that my prayers are not answered? Some of you today may have come in, and you've put all the ingredients in that you know to. Just doesn't seem like we're getting any answers. I'm glad you've asked. There is room here at this point for, for self-evaluation. You see, there are times when the Spirit of God puts His finger on something in our life or in our lifestyle that we need to deal with, that we need to change, that we need to remove, that we need to stop doing. And there comes a time if we choose to continue to ignore that, that God's going to ignore your prayers. And the scripture says this in Psalm 66, 18. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So there is room for self-evaluation, but let me just say this. Just because a prayer is not being answered doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. In fact, I want to share something with you. I want to share a personal story. I don't want to draw the attention to me in this story, but I do want to share it for the, just the, the sake of what we're dealing with today. Back in February, I had a kidney transplant. Many of you knew that. Many of you have prayed for us. You messaged us on Facebook. You came and hugged our necks. You supported us. You you gave. You've done so many different things in this church. Uh, in fact, prior to the going into the surgery, the church staff prayed over my family out here in the in the church lobby, and that was such a, a blessing that we received. So many people in the community. In fact, I have a I have a picture up here. I'm going to show you of the football field, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to come to that in just a minute. But I want you to understand that that this procedure that I was going into had a less than 1% chance of failure rate with some of the greatest doctors in the world. Less than 1%. Laser-focused prayer going into this gig. God, we pray that you'd be the, with the physicians. God, we pray that you would uh, allow the kidney to function. God, we pray that everything would go smoothly. I had the surgery on Tuesday the 23rd. They found out after they had it done that I was leaking a little bit, so they had to go back in. They went in, rubbed a little dirt on it, put it back in. Tried it a second time. They said, the kidney's not functioning. We're going to come back tomorrow, which was Wednesday. They said, we're going we're to look at this thing again. So we're going to explore Tori's surgery on Wednesday and see how he's doing and seeing if there's some blood flow. So they went in on that Wednesday and they started seeing some blood flow and, and people were still praying. They said, you know what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give this a couple of days. We're going to come back on Friday. And, and, and if on Friday we see the kind of blood flow through that kidney that we need, then we're going to leave it in. But if not, we're going to have to take it out. On Thursday night, prior to my last surgery, our head football coach, Steve Airy sent out a text to his parents and to the players. He said, hey, tomorrow morning at 7.45, we're going to pray for Coach Taylor. And that's the people that gathered right there, and I will never forget that image. I went into surgery that next morning, and the kidney did not function. How do you explain that? In fact, let's just take the focus off of my story and, and let's put it on yours. How do you explain the fact that we're doing everything we know to do to put the right ingredients in 
and yet for some reason we're not getting the results we want I'm glad you asked that question because we're going to finish with something very positive today first I want to tell you that I have a new donor In all truth, some of you are not going to believe this. It's my mother-in-law. <laughs> I had a buddy of mine when I told him that. He said, nobody's a match with their mother-in-law. <laughs> we've had such a big time over that, you know, and, and we've laughed about what kind of personality traits am I going to take on, you know, receiving her kidney. And the first thing my father-in-law said was, he said, you're not telling me what to do. I want to tell you what happens. When you pray. I believe God gave me this visual. And he's taught me this lesson. When prayer goes in, grace always comes out. Always. Sometimes grace comes out in the form of exactly what you asked for, right? Some of you through the pandemic have prayed for a job and God gave you a job some of you have prayed for transportation God gave it to you some of you prayed for your kids you start seeing some change but some of you you've done all you know to do you've put in all the ingredients in prayer that you know to put in and I want to tell you that what God wants to give you is what you need to get you through what you're going through he promises to do that James 4 6 God opposes the proud but listen to me he gives grace to the humble gives grace to the humble. I love Hebrews 4, 6, and I'm almost finished. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, and there we will receive mercy. And watch this. We will find grace to help when we need it the most. Amen. A friend of ours that visited us in St. Louis when we were having our surgery sent us this message on Facebook yesterday morning not knowing, having no clue I was preaching on prayer today and it's a prayer from Max, Pastor Max Lacado, and it says our prayers may be awkward our attempts may be feeble but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it. Our prayers make a difference. This morning, first of all, I really tried to get through this without crying. Told myself I was going to do it. I failed. <laughs> um, but I'm crying because of the grace of God. It's okay. <laughs> You know, you walked in here this morning and I have no idea what you're dealing with. I have no idea what ingredients you've been putting in, but I just, my heart's prayer and I believe God's heartbeat more importantly for us today is that some of us have thrown in the towel on prayer and you need to get back in the game. 
you hung up the cleats, it's time to get back in. Some of you may have become a little bit disillusioned with, with what God wants to do in your life and you're uncertain. You need to just, you need to come back to prayer. You need to come back to Him. There may be some of you in the room today, you're going, I don't know what this prayer thing's about. I don't know that I've ever really truly connected with God in prayer and He wants you to do that today. In fact, remember, God tells us, He, he listens to you through a spiritual stethoscope. He, he hears your heart's cry and if you'll reach out to Him today and say, Lord, I need you in my life. I need to reconnect. I need to be connected to you, God, for the first time. You can do that today. It's all about admitting that you are not him. And you want to acknowledge and yield your life and your will to a God who loves you and to a God who died on a cross for you. To forgive you of all of your sins give you new life and give you grace God wants you to have grace today you can pray that today right where you're sitting maybe some of us that are the reason we're struggling to pray the reason we're struggling to worship is because there's something between us and we just need to get it right